morning and welcome to this hour of worship together. It's good to be uh, here as God's people on a, a beautiful, glorious, sunny day. So hope that you're uh, eager and ready to worship the great God that we have. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 93, verse 4. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Let's worship this mighty God. receive words of greeting from our awesome God. May the grace of Christ our Savior and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all richly. Amen. Let's take time to uh, greet our neighbor in the love of the Lord, his grace. In our uh, daily round of activities, there's plenty of things to draw us, uh, our minds in different directions, but this is a time we can just focus on God.
to admire him, to worship him. Uh, God is a God of supreme power, but he's also a loving God, a, a God of great love. So let's uh, worship this mighty God of love. God, we, we worship you for your deep, deep love for us. Uh, we in ourselves are so undeserving, uh, yet you in your vast, vast love uh, chose us, called us, sent Jesus to be our Savior. Uh, you've sent the Holy Spirit to live in us, to give us power to deal with daily life. Uh, we love you for all of this. And we pray that in the midst of busy lives, this would be just an oasis, a time to get in touch once again with your presence, your power, your love for us, that we'd be refreshed in our souls for anything that life can throw at us. So bless us together, and may you be pleased with our worship. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We are going to invite the children to children's worship, ages three through grade five. Uh, while they go, we'll take our offering. Uh, first is for our church and ministry. The second is for the Downtown Community Health Center, uh, an important ministry to human need in our community. So um, let me offer a prayer for the children's worship time, and then they'll be excused and we'll take our offering. God, we have just worshiped you uh, for your might as well as your deep, deep love. And it's our desire, our hope that our children would, would know that as well. They'd know you this way. So bless our children's worship time. Bless the worship leaders. Bless each child that they would hear the gospel message in ways they can understand it. We pray that there'd be wonderful fellowship and friendships that 
are present in and through this time, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So children are invited to uh, worship, and we'll receive our offerings. So wonderful, such versatility going from the praise team right to the organ. So thanks. Uh, we come into God's holy presence not pretending to be perfect. Uh, we come as sinners who need his grace daily, uh, weekly in our lives. And it's wonderful that we can come with the confidence of a God who receives sinners uh, through his grace in Christ. Uh, we're going to read from Ephesians 4, the first six verses, as one expression of God's will. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now let's uh, bow together in a prayer of confession. Lord Jesus, you have called us to be completely humble. Uh, we confess sometimes we're too full of ourselves. We think we know better than others. Jesus, you've called us to be gentle. We confess sometimes we're rough on others. Jesus, you've called us to be patient. We confess sometimes we can lose our cool and say things and do things that hurt others and dishonor your name. Jesus, you call us to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit. We confess that sometimes we make every effort to prove we are right, but we don't make every effort to keep unity among brothers and sisters. So, Lord, in this moment, have mercy on us afresh. Forgive us for our sins. 
Fill us with your spirit and the fruit of peace. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. And hear these grand old words of assurance from Ephesians chapter 2. For it is by grace you have been saved. Uh, this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God so that no one can boast. In gratitude for that, let's join together in the song, Create in Me. We're going to spend some time in prayer together, uh, but before we do, um, I've got a rather long list of announcements to share, I think about a half dozen. Uh, first of all, I just want to say a welcome back to Vaughn and Wilma. Um, they've been away for five, six weeks, so good to have you back. They were in sunnier climes, avoiding some of our cold snap, so welcome. And I just wanted to say, too, I, I learned this past week that uh, Wilma, uh, this past year, was diagnosed very early with breast cancer. And uh, fortunately, it was caught so early, it's been treated, uh, completely clear of it at this point. Um, but after that treatment, sort of recovering, getting back to, to full strength. So we give, we give praise to God. Wilma was telling me that in receiving some of the radiation treatments, you're among people that um, are just dealing with uh, really, really difficult situations, so uh, giving thanks to God for his mercy in her life. Uh, secondly, this is the last Sunday, so that's a welcome back, and now we've got a couple of farewells to say. So Esther, uh, Esther has been an international student from the Netherlands, staying with Roger and Dorothy, and uh, and they're boys, so she's the, the female presence among them as a student at Fredericton Christian Academy uh, with the twins and will be flying back tomorrow. Um, it's just wonderful how Esther just joined in the young people's activities and um, I guess just as an all-around awesome girl. So uh, we're glad you've been with us and um, you know, we hope that through school and church that the ways you've met Jesus will stick with you as you, you head back. Uh, then another, a more temporary farewell. This is the last uh, Sunday uh, for John and Ellie Volk before uh, they head off on part of John's sabbatical. So he's got a six-month uh, sabbatical from the University of New Brunswick. They're heading to uh, warmer climes, uh, South Africa, a place there. And in his project, he's a professor of worldview at UNB in the Renaissance College. And so his big project is writing a book in that field of expertise on world views. And you think of all the tensions between different religious groups, different sectors of a global world, um, how timely really to understand how people view things. So uh, John and Ellie and John Harmon uh, spending a little while here heading back to his professor post in uh, the Netherlands. We just wish you God's safety and, and blessing in these uh, days and months ahead. 
Uh, then uh, from the weekly email, or maybe if you've read the church bulletin already, um, you've spotted that uh, Rob Brown resigned uh, serving as an elder on our council. And I think that caught at least me by surprise. Um, Rob shared uh, a growing sense of angst and a shortage of time that he felt uh, with other core commitments in his life. So just want to say that we as a council will miss your presence at our uh, meetings and we express thanks to you, Rob, for your time serving as elder and, and chair of our council. Uh, two more announcements. Uh, this past week also our council sent a letter uh, explaining the reversal of one area on our church profile developed for our pastor search and that would be to include at least consideration of any female candidates. And um, I, I just thought I would say a few uh, pastoral words at this juncture. Um, uh, we know that this is a, a complicated and delicate issue. Uh, among us and many other places, there's two differing convictions on women uh, serving as elder or minister of the word and here's just some perspective that I would offer to us as we try to navigate our way through. Um, differing views here, it's not a primary issue on which our salvation depends. Uh, it's an important, but it's a secondary doctrine. Uh, just like end times views or infant baptism, there's differing views among God's people. And uh, we know that we're going to be sharing fellowship for all eternity together. And so we believe an issue like that as we work through this shouldn't break our fellowship in this life when we're going to be together for all eternity as well. And that the important and uh, powerful doctrine of unity, Christ's call to unity among his people, that transcends any different conviction we may have at this level. So I hope we uh, keep all of that in mind. And this leads up to the last announcement. It's kind of good timing. We had planned this really prior uh, to this um, development, but to have a two-evening teaching forum that will present the biblical passages and the case for each uh, view, conviction, on this issue. So the first setting will be a week from Sunday in the evening, 7 to 8.30, and then two weeks later, February 11, uh, 7 to 8.30, Sunday evening. So right here. Um, and, and we'll get done right at 8 o'clock, uh, 8.30. I, I know that families, you've got to get up in the morning, uh, so we're going to honor that time if you're thinking about your schedule and week. I will say this to families. Um, I just think this is so important that we sit under the teaching of God's Word together, and I think this is pretty important at this juncture in our life. So if you've got kids, we know that hour is after they're going to bed, so if ever there's a time to call in a grandparent or your best babysitter, I encourage you to consider that so you can both be present for that time together. Okay, that's, uh, that's all of my announcements. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we, here we are in your presence and we come as thankful people, thankful for all your goodness to us. Thank you for health and strength and daily food, for warm clothing and snug homes. Thank you for the beauty of the snow and the opportunity to go skiing. And thanks for powerful machines that remove snow from the roads we need to travel. God, our Father, thank you for all the ways you show your love to us. Through the gospel accounts which show Jesus' love for all kinds of people, thank you for the love of parents, for the love of a husband or wife, for the precious love of children, for really good friends who care about us, for the love flowing through saints in the church. 
And thank you for your individual care in our lives. Thanks that, um, that Wilma Grant can testify that uh, this cancer was caught really early, successfully treated, uh, that she's well on the, on the way to recovery, and so we praise your name for your care for her. And Sovereign Lord, as usual, there's a lot going on in our lives and in our church. Uh, thank you that Esther was able to spend a semester here, hosted by the Drosts. Thank you for good conversations, for fun together, school life and young people's activities. And may Esther's opportunities to meet Jesus through all this stick with her, always. Uh, bless her as she flies back to the Netherlands and resumes life and studies there. Lord, we pray too for John and Ellie Valk as they begin a sabbatical period. I thank you for their fine leadership in helping us receive the Al-Obed family from Syria. And now grant them safe travel to South Africa. Grant them refreshment and delight in a new setting there. Prosper John's efforts to write a book in his field on world views that will be helpful. And God our Father, at the beginning of the year, we talked about the unexpected twists that a year can bring, and, and Rob Brown's resignation from council was, was unexpected, but with your help, uh, we can stand strong. And we pray now for Rob, uh, relieved of some of the stress he felt uh, to enjoy greater time with family and his unfolding job. And we pray too for our council, especially our elders, as we carry on without this valued brother. Uh, thank you for the confidence we can find in Philippians 4, verse 13, that I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And God of truth, and wisdom, we also pray together about the pastor search process. Uh, it raises all kinds of angles, a pastor's ministry description, a sabbatical policy, housing options, salary, the scope of our search. And Lord, you well know that there are two different convictions among us on women serving as elder or minister. So it, it's a complicated matter. Help us now to be gentle, to listen carefully to your word and to one another. Bless the teaching forum on this issue and may a sweet spirit of love and unity in Christ help us navigate this and any issue in the future where we have different views. Lord, we look to you for kindness and care in our individual needs in the week ahead, whether health concerns, whether dealing with some anxiety or depression, difficulties in relationship, work issues. Grant us each day, each hour, your love and grace and power and peace. And we humbly pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, today we're uh, continuing a new series of messages, uh, Encounters with Jesus. We've just celebrated Jesus' birth. Uh, before too long, we'll be heading into Lenten season, uh, Good Friday, Holy Week, uh, the Resurrection. So this is a season where it's fitting for us to see uh, Jesus' life, not whence he was born and prior to his death, so let's uh, prepare our hearts for that. Our song of illumination is, I love to tell the story. Let's stand.
Today's Bible readings, John 2, 1 to 11. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I ask you to open our ears and our hearts so we may understand what is said in the scriptures and to be with Pastor Neil as he expands on it. On the third day, a wedding took place in Canaan in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother came and said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to his servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone jars, the kind used by the Jews' ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of banquet. So they did, and the master of the banquet tasted the water and had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first when they, when then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Canaan of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. So far the reading. Thank you, Mary. I encourage you to uh, have your Bibles open in front of you. I think it's, uh, it's a great practice. And I'm going to be uh, walking sort of verse by verse through this passage. So I encourage you that way. So the Apostle John uh, begins this uh, particular account with on the third day. On the third day. And it might be easy for us to breeze past that little detail. It seems rather insignificant, but, but that phrase should set bells ringing. Uh, you see, on the third day is biblical code. And we find this uh, biblical code all through uh, scriptures. Genesis 22, on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the mountain in the distance. It was on that third day he took the knife to sacrifice his own son, but at the last moment the angel of the Lord said, uh, stop, wait, do not lay a hand on the boy. And then on that mountain God provided another sacrifice, a foreshadowing of the cross of Christ. Exodus 19 we read, on the third day, the Lord descended on Mount Sinai with thunder and lightning. And then he revealed his law, the Ten Commandments, which to us are more precious than gold. Or Esther 5, on the third day, Esther risked entering the king's presence without an invitation, and the king granted her appeal, and God's people were saved from Haman's vile plot to destroy them. Or Jonah 1, after three days the Lord delivered Jonah out of the, the belly of the great fish. And, and of course Jonah went on to preach repentance in the great city of Nineveh, and, and all were spared. So you get the picture. On the third day, has become biblical code that God is going to do something special to reveal himself and do great things for his people. And now John writes, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. So here again, bells should go off. We should be wondering, what great thing will God be doing there? 
Now, John gives us some details about the wedding, a few details. Jesus' mother was there. Uh, aha, and Mary has been already at the center of some pretty amazing uh, events, uh, things of God, uh, an angel appearing to her and telling her that, that she would give birth to the very Son of God. And, and then as a virgin, conceiving by the Holy Spirit, and giving birth to a son, and then in that manger, having this troop of shepherds show up and tell them that, that a host of angels had appeared and, and announced that that child would be the savior of the world. So, so Mary's no stranger to God's amazing work. And then verse 2, and Jesus and his disciples had been invited to the wedding. And by this time, we should be on the edge of our seats. What is God going to do? Now, at first, it all seems uh, rather ordinary. They're just attending a, a regular wedding in the, an ordinary place like Cana. Uh, scholars say that wedding feasts in those days didn't just last an evening like our culture, but... Uh, they would last for days, sometimes even a full week. And a feast like that <clears throat> featured good meat, and meat was expensive, often hard to find, as well as fine wine. So all of this is pretty ordinary to this point, but then a problem arose. They ran out of wine. Uh, apparently they had no professional worship planner to estimate the exact needs of all the guests there. And, and a celebration was unthinkable without wine to gladden their hearts. It was, it was embarrassing. And Mary noticed, she noticed that the wine had run out. Uh, and she didn't ignore it. She didn't say, well, you know, I'm just a guest, it's, it's not my problem. Uh, here's a beautiful thing. She wanted to be helpful. But she herself was helpless. She certainly didn't have the money to, to go out somewhere and buy more wine. So there was really nothing Mary could do to remedy the, the problem. So she could have thrown up her hands and shrugged her shoulders. What can I do? But instead... Mary turned to Jesus. She turned to Jesus, and this is the, the pivotal point in the story. Mary alerted Jesus to the need. They have no more wine. And it's interesting here. Mary, uh, she tells Jesus the problem, but she doesn't seem have, to have any solution herself. She doesn't know what to do. But she does know, in sort of this general way, that, that Jesus could help. And I think what a, what a life lesson for us right here. Uh, you know, one of my favorite uh, sayings, uh, frequent sayings these days, is life is complicated. Seems the longer I live, the more I see that. And, you know, inevitably, uh, we run into problems. And, and some problems are so difficult that we have no idea what to do with it. Uh, no solutions. But we can always turn to Jesus. We can tell him about the problem we're facing and look to him to help. Now, from Jesus' initial reaction, it, it seems at first that he's unwilling. He says, dear woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Uh, and what does he mean by my hour? Well, his hour refers to when his true identity would be made known. You see, most of the people, they had this idea of a Messiah, the promised Messiah, who would be a political conquering king, not the suffering servant Jesus came to be. Jesus didn't want people to paint him 
with their preconceptions. And so he sought, so they could see him for who, who he really was, he sought to keep his full identity quiet for a while. But despite Jesus' caution, Mary persists. This, this mild, humble woman, uh, she is persistent. She, she persists in her hopes that Jesus will help despite his initial reluctance. So she says to the servants, she's so confident about this, uh, she just says to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And here I think is another great lesson for us God's people that we too should be persistent in asking for Jesus' help. Uh, like Mary, we should keep on looking for Jesus' aid. We, we should keep on praying for God's help in our lives. Let me tell you something personal here. It, it's been a sadness for Ruth and me that neither of our sons is actively following Jesus right now. Uh, neither has made a commitment to a church, um, and there are certain areas where they've decided to follow their will rather than God's. And of course, we've been praying for them, praying for them all along for the Holy Spirit's transforming work in their hearts and souls, but no change yet. And there are some days praying and praying and no change yet that, uh, you know, I, I feel kind of weary. Uh, this again, praying about the same thing with no particular change yet. But, but Mary is a good reminder to persist, to keep on looking for Jesus' help. And now Jesus takes action. Nearby stood six stone water jars, each containing 20 to 30 gallons. So they're, they're good sized. And Jesus says to the servants, fill those jars with water. So they did. And then he said, now draw some out and bring it to the master of the banquet. And they did. And somewhere along the way, the water turned into wine. Now, the, the master of the banquet didn't realize where this wine had come from, but he did recognize quality wine when he tasted it. Uh, he was amazed. He said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, but you've saved the best till now. And here's uh, another wonderful truth for us to soak in and savor. In his grace, God's gifts to us aren't cheap and inferior. He provided choice wine for the feast. God's gifts to us are choice of the highest quality, the best. Think of that in nature the grandeur of mountains, the beauty of deep forests, the vast seas. Even more, think of it in our redemption, the gift of Jesus himself and eternal life and the presence of the Holy Spirit. God's gifts to us are the best, the best So Jesus turns water into wine in this ordinary wedding in an ordinary town of Cana. And I also want you to see that, uh, that Jesus then is there for us in the ordinary events of our lives, in our work, in our play, at a wedding, at a meal. You know, I think about this. Most of us are pretty ordinary people. Most of us lead ordinary lives. Jesus just doesn't just show up in spectacular uh, Mount Sinai moments. No, he is there for us in the ordinary events of life. 
We just need eyes to see it. Now, imagine Mary observing all of this, this, this amazing turning water into wine. Um, uh, uh, you can imagine her thinking, that's my boy. Jesus really came through here. And I'm sure that Mary pondered this miracle, this wonder in her heart. And, and in pondering this encounter with Jesus, in thinking about this miracle, what did, what did Mary learn about the divine son? Well, first, like Mary, Jesus wants to help. Jesus wants to help. Jesus doesn't ignore our needs. He's not self-absorbed. He's not hard-hearted. Jesus stands ready to help us. Second, unlike Mary, Jesus is able to help. Mary herself was helpless to solve this shortage of wine, but Jesus had the power to help. In fact, he shows himself to be Lord over all creation. Jesus has divine power, transformative power, to turn water into wine. And third, uh, Mary learns the scope of Jesus' help, that he, he wasn't stingy. He was generous in quantity and in quality. Jesus didn't just serve up a few glasses of wine. Uh, apparently, there were gallons. He didn't uh, provide cheap wine. He provided choice wine. Jesus is generous. So Mary learned all those things in this encounter. You know, Psalm 121 says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. In this moment, Jesus shows himself to be the fulfillment of Psalm 121. And in all situations, may our reflex by faith be to turn to Jesus, who's the source of help. So brothers and sisters, uh, inevitably there will be times in life when we run out of our own resources. Uh, there may be times like Mary when uh, we are helpless, really, to deal with our situation. What are we to do? Turn to Jesus. Ask for his help. You know, I think about uh, a marriage that is under serious stress. There can be so many cutting words, uh, so many slights, so many hurts, distance that grows, and you've tried this or that, but nothing seems to work. You feel helpless to fix things. What to do? Like Mary, turn to Jesus. He is willing to help. He is able to help. He turned water into wine. He can transform and reconcile a marriage. Or I think, too, of a conversation I once had with a mother of a son who was caught in the grip of alcohol. And uh, into his 30s at this point, he'd received treatment, he'd been through detoxification, but every time, sooner or later, he went back to drinking. He just couldn't break the demonic power of his addiction. I mean, he... Uh, is proved by his life. He was helpless. What to do? Turn to Jesus. He's willing to help. He's able to help generously. Or I think of cancer patients. Sometimes there comes a point where the doctor says, I'm sorry, we've tried everything. 
There's nothing more we can do. And that's a helpless feeling. What to do? Like Mary, turn to Jesus, ask him to help. He, he may not do a miracle. Uh, we don't control him like a puppet, but he will provide comfort and a peace that transcends all understanding. So right now I just want to ask each of you, uh, do you face some problem? Is there some need in your life, some shortage? And like Mary, do you feel helpless to, to handle it, whatever it may be? Friends, turn to Jesus. He is willing to help, he's able to help, and he's generous in his help. One, one final thing. Uh, ultimately, our greatest problem is not shortage of wine at a wedding. Our biggest need isn't uh, more food or better health or a bigger house or a better bank account. Our greatest problem is sin. And our greatest need is for that sin against God to be removed. But here's the thing, there's, there's nothing we can do on our own to remove our wrongs. Um, uh, we're not able to pay off the debt of our sins. Uh, I, I like this analogy, it's like a, a credit card where you keep charging more things but you can never make any payment on the balance. And every day that debt grows bigger and bigger. What to do? Turn to Jesus. Tell him your problem with sin. Confess your sins. Then, then ask him to pay for your debt. To remove all the sins that get in the way. And I'll tell you this, like those big stone jars... Uh, God's grace is plenty big enough to wash away all our sins. So on the third day at the wedding, Jesus uh, showed transforming power and glory. It was revealed. And now the very last verse of our passage, verse 11, Jesus adds that turning water into wine was the first of Jesus' miraculous signs, the first. The supreme sign, the ultimate sign one day, is that on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead to conquer our sin and to give us new life in him. So brothers and sisters, no matter what your situation, will you Turn to Jesus. Will you, like Mary, ask for his transforming help? And then you can watch and see the great thing he will do. Let's pray together. Ah, oh, Jesus, this is quite a scene. It's uh, quite a treat for us to see you in action. Uh, all the angles, what we learn about you, what Mary learned about you, about your willingness to help, your power over nature to transform water into wine, your generosity. And wow, what, a, what a joy that we can follow you, when you're that kind of leader, that kind of savior, that kind of Lord. Uh, who else would we want to follow but one who has that kind of care and power for us? And Lord, it's uh, easy to think about these things on a Sunday morning, and then Monday morning comes, Tuesday afternoon comes, and situations arise, and uh, it's easy to look elsewhere. It's easy to feel defeated. Help us to walk with you to keep our minds fixed on you, to by faith grow the kind of trust that when difficult situations arise, it's reflex to turn to you and ask for help. And then on 
with bated breath, look for ways that you will intervene. And we pray that if there is anyone here who does face a, a difficult, tough situation, they feel helpless, they've got no resources to solve it, to fix it, to, to overcome it, that, that in this day, this week, they will turn to you consciously, purposefully, cry out to you in prayer and, and ask for your help. And we, we know, Jesus, that, that you are willing, that you will respond. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Our song of response is God Who Created Hearts to Love. It uh, speaks of God's power and Jesus' transforming power in our lives. Uh, let's stand. We'll sing uh, stanzas one, two, three, and five together. God Who Created Hearts to Love. I invite you all to stay a while for fellowship after the worship service. Can say some goodbyes to Esther and John and Ellie and John Harmon. And as we uh, head from this place, receive the blessing of the Sovereign Lord. Friends in Christ, now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you his love and his peace. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.